Good morning. Man Check United Methodist Church, this is a great day to be here in worshiping community together. We have bells, we have a baptism, and we have a message from scripture in store for you. It is a good day to be together. It's a good time of year to be together, too, because as we're in the midst of our fall season, we have many things in the life of the church that you'll want to be a part of. I mean, right now, a craft sale, it'll be open until one o'clock, so after worship, you can feel free to wander over and check out what crafts are left, and, and the craft group uses the funds from that for so many missional projects through our community. It's such a blessing, um, and I've used many of those crafts for Christmas presents. We have a harvest food drive going on throughout the month. You can see a little display in the narthex. We're trying to collect goods for those in need in our community and to restock our food pantry. We have the tree lot, which will be going up just this, the, the, the perimeter today because the day after Thanksgiving, our tree lot will be open and we'll have hundreds of trees for sale, great trees for you to choose from. And so youth, be here at 3.30 to help set up that lot. We'll be getting in our tree lot mode very soon. We also have the angel tree, which will be placed in the Narthex starting next week. And on that, that tree, we'll have angels. That you, these are children from the elementary school across the street who have some wishes and hopes for Christmas season that will be difficult for their parents to fulfill. And so we get the blessing of being a part of their Christmas. And so starting next week, for the following four weeks after that, you can choose uh, an angel or, or a child to be an angel too. Which one's the angel? We're both angels. Everyone's an angel. And you can do, uh, do that gift-giving opportunity. Also next week is the date that we're asking as a church for our members to return their estimate of giving cards. It is with those cards that we help, it helps us create the budget for 2022. And so if you could drop them in the basket in the Narthex by next week, um, and it should contain only money given towards the operating budget because other pledges are separate. So thank you for that. Um, if you could take a moment, find this QR code in your bulletin, and at some point during the worship service, scan that, let us know through a, uh, that QR code that you are here. It helps us keep a good log of attendance and keeps us in remembering to be praying for you throughout the week. And those who are worshiping online, we have not forgotten about you. We're so glad you're here. Please say hello to each other in the chat box. And with that, let's all rise as we open our bulletins to the call to worship. The word has come for us from God, who promises to shelter us under the wings of hope and grace. The word has come to us from Jesus, who encourages us to remember the good news we have received. The word flows to us from the Spirit, who reminds us to place our hope and trust in God. And now find in your hymnal number 181, ye servants of God.
brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. On behalf of the whole church, I present John Bradford Crockett, the son of Reagan Crockett and Brad Crockett for the sacrament of holy baptism. Come on up here in the middle so everyone can get a good look at John Bradford. And we got our godparents coming up to join us as well. Now I will ask you too, as John Bradford's parents, to reaffirm your own baptismal covenant. So on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, of reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church with which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, orientations, and races? If so, say, I do. Parents, having just reaffirmed your own baptismal vows, will you nurture John Bradford in Christ's mm -hmm. holy church, that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself? to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, say we will. Amen. Godparents, grandparents, family, I invite the rest of the family to rise. For you, will you keep John Bradford and his parents in your prayers that they may fulfill these vows? And will you love and nurture John Bradford in the Christian faith and life that he may grow in the love of God. If so, please say, we will. And now I invite the entire congregation to rise. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, please say, we do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and with God's help, include John Bradford, now before you in your care. If so, please say, we will. Now join me in the congregational response found in your worship guide. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround John Bradford with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his trust of God and be found faithful in his service to others. We will pray for him that he may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. You may be seated. <laughs> Let us pray. In the beginning when there was chaos, you swept across the waters and brought forth light and then life. In Noah's time, you redeemed life on the ark through water. You parted the Red Sea and brought people as slaves to freedom. You nurtured Jesus through the womb of water. And he was baptized by water and by the Holy Spirit in the Jordan. We pray, O oh God, that you're, you will pour out your Holy Spirit on this gift of water and on John Bradford who receives it. That sin will be washed away and righteousness will be in him. May your grace be present in his life, and your love sustain him for the journey ahead, now and for all eternity. And let the people of God say together, Amen. All right. Let's see if he'll let me hold the baby John Bradford. Hi, sweetie. You're a good boy. Oh. Yeah, Mom is the most important person, I know. Okay, we can let him stay. We're together. John Bradford, I baptize you in the name of the Father <laughs> and of the Son <laughs> and the Holy Spirit, <laughs> one God forever in love for John Bradford and his family.
<laughs> Let the people of God say amen. 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 Family leaders, godparents, are you still here? Okay. Family, how about the whole church? Just raise your hand towards John Bradford as we give him this blessing. John Bradford, having been born of water in the spirit, may you always know the loving grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, this is our newest baby brother. I commend him to your love and care. We all have a role to play. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his home, and perfect him in love. Let us remember that we are responsible to be his Christian family on his good days and his bad days, no matter what his needs are. Let us lift him up in every stage of life and every moment, that he may never forget that he is surrounded by the grace and love of God. Repeat after me. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome John Bradford as a member of the family of Christ. Let's celebrate our new member. Thank you. As we do celebrate the baptism of John Bradford, I invite you to sing with us, Child of Blessing, Child of Promise, the words are for you in your bulletin. I absolutely love when we have baptisms, and one of the things I think Tanzan left out is that as congregational response, that includes things like Sunday school and volunteering for youth group and definitely VBS, so keep a lookout for those opportunities. And now I want to welcome the children here. This is children's time, so whether you're here in person or you are online, I'm Miss Kim, and this word is for you. So when I was a little girl, my dad used to ask me all the time, is that money burning a hole in your pocket? So have you ever heard that phrase? Yeah, what that means is when I would get money, like for my birthday or Christmas or even just allowance, I would want to go spend it right away. And I often did. And I would go and I'd spend my money and I'd buy something. And then like not even a week later, it wouldn't be that important. It would just be something sitting on a shelf or in my closet and then I didn't have the money anymore, and I just had this useless thing that I had purchased. And so, I don't know if you're like that. I'm, I'm a little bit still like that sometimes. Um, but this, this today, we're talking about how to reduce our financial stress. So what that means is, how do we take care of our money so we don't do stuff like that and run out and blow it all at once? And the Bible can help us with this. The Bible talks a lot about money. So I'm going to sum up just a few of the things that it says. The first is that the Bible warns us not to care too much about it. In fact, it says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And what that basically means is if we're spending all our time worrying about our money or how much we have, then we often forget about God or we forget about taking care of others. And so the Bible warns us not to do that. The Bible also says and encourages us to be responsible for those who have a lot, they're, they're given the responsibility to do something with that and to do good things with that. 
And finally, the Bible reminds us to be generous. Over and over again, the Bible helps us to remember to care for those who don't have as much as we do. So I brought a tool with me that you can use and make one at home to help you do those things. Oh, I forgot to say, John Wesley, <laughs> our Methodist uh, founder, summed all that up by saying, earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. So in the spirit of that, I have three cans. Um, <laughs> but you could use jars or you could use boxes or anything else that you have at home. And it's just sort of like a piggy bank, except for it has three places to store your money instead of one. And the first one says uh, spend. And this is, if you get birthday money or allowance money, you can put some of it in here. And this is for you to just go shopping with and just spend on whatever you want to spend on in the moment. That's the money that's burning a hole in your pocket. The second one says save. Now this is what, where you want to put some of that money aside to save for really important things or really special things. Maybe you're saving up for something that you've wanted for a long time. I knew one child who started saving when he was little, and then when he was 16, bought a car with his own money that he had been saving forever. And the last one says share. And this is where you want to put money that you want to give to help others. So you might bring it to church and drop it in the Sunday school offering, or when we do our noisy offering for children's mission projects, or maybe you give it to a school fundraiser or to some other charity of your choice. But this is where the money that you put aside to help other people. So that's one way that you can not burn a hole in your pocket like I always did and spend my money, but to be responsible and make good choices. So let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for all the blessings you give us. You provide everything we need. And even some things we just want. Help us to, sa to save our money wisely. And use it to help others. Amen. This is the time in our service where we, as a community of faith, lift up our celebrations and concerns. If you have a celebration concern and uh, you are here, uh, you are welcome. We'll start the prayer time in a moment with a, a moment of silence, and you can lift up your prayer silently to God that way. You can always go to the church website, and on the church website, under the ministry tab and the sharing link, uh, there is a virtual prayer card that you can fill out. If you're watching with us on Facebook Live, feel free to enter your celebration or concern in the chat box. So let us go to God in prayer. Merciful God, you are more than we can ever imagine. Give us a wider vision of the world. Give us a broader view of justice. Give us dreams of peace that are not defined by boundaries of geography or race or religion or by the limitations of worldly structures or systems. Open our eyes and our ears that wherever we go, we may hear your voice calling us by name, calling us to serve, calling us to share, calling us to praise, so that we never give up on the promise of your kingdom, where the world is being transformed and all can enjoy life in all its fullness. And so we remember your Son, who transformed lives and with the Holy Spirit still transforms lives today as we pray the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'd like to invite Tanya Norman to come forward as she gives us a moment of stewardship. Good morning. This year marks the 30th year of my membership here at Manchac United Methodist Church. Uh, for those of you who have been here as long as I have will remember Janice Riggle Huey was the pastor at the time. So a lot of pastors have come through this church, a lot of members have come through this church, but the constant is the faith. Um, Recently, we, we celebrated All Saints Sunday, and um, this year I was uh, honored to have my father's name added, uh, called aloud, uh, as he passed away this year. And he has always been my greatest example of, uh, of a servant in terms of following the Christian faith, in terms of stewardship. He always said that you should give your first fruits to God, because stewardship is the ultimate statement of faith. If you put your trust in God and give first fruits to, to, to the Lord and to the church and to your community, God will provide what is necessary for the rest of your life. And that's really the ultimate challenge that we have as people in our world today is to trust in God, that God will provide, rather than have the world be our source of, of what we need, our, of sustenance. This community of faith is, is very important to me and will continue to be important to me in the next, hopefully, 30 years of my life uh, here. And it's important that we contribute to our congregation, to the mission of this church, to provide a place for us to gather as a community of faith and to open our doors to the world so that they can find a home where they can see Christ in action. And it's also important for us to use our stewardship to take our action out into the world. So we manifest what Christ wants us to be in the world. And then we come home to our church again and be restored and renewed. So I encourage you all to give generously and faithfully and put your trust in God as the giver of all things. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Scripture this morning, as we talk about, continue our series on stress, comes from Paul's letter to Timothy. Timothy is the lead pastor of the largest group of Christians in the world at that time in the city of Ephesus. And in the fifth chapter of Timothy, uh, Paul has encouraged Timothy to make sure that those who were uh, teaching and preaching and the spreading of the word of God were taken care of. And he gives them a famous line from the ancient world. In fact, Jesus himself had used something similar, that a laborer is worthy of their wages. But now the discussion moves on in chapter 6, and Paul seems to note that there's some false teaching out there that says that religion is just basically a way to get rich, that uh, faith in God is a way to make sure that you are prosperous. Or another possibility, and this to me seems more likely, that there were folks out there who were actually sharing the gospel and peddling it as a means of becoming wealthy. It is to these people, I believe, that Paul speaks in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. Of course there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pains. And then he goes on to speak a word to the wealthy who are in the congregation in verse 17. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, 
to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I couldn't help but think of something that happened to me about three decades ago. My wife was working the night shift. I was home. Kids were in bed. So I was switching channels. And I came upon a tele-evangelist. Interesting guy. He wasn't preaching. He was sitting in a chair. He had a beard. He was holding a pipe. And he was reading to them on TV from 1 Timothy 5, where Paul tells Timothy, make sure you take care of the people that are teaching and preaching because a laborer is worthy of their wages. So then he took the pipe out of his mouth, looked straight at the TV and said, if you're listening, I'm your teacher. God commands you send in the money and put it back in his mouth. At that moment, I heard something gag. I believe it was the Apostle Paul. I believe he almost fell out of heaven because Paul would have said to the guy, no, 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 wait a minute, that's not what I meant. In chapter 5, I was not writing for myself. I was writing for the people in Timothy's area who were trying to do good work uh, on, on behalf of those who haven't heard the gospel. And I was just saying, make sure they were taken care of. I wasn't telling them to take care of me. In fact, if you know much about Paul, you may know that he wrote the Corinthians and he said, look, I could ask you for money. Speakers, he said, and laborers ought to be paid. But he said, I don't. I have a job. I work making tents among you because I don't want anybody to think that the gospel is for sale. So first of all, I think the guy uh, misunderstood that part about Paul. Secondly, I don't think he ever took the pipe out long enough to keep reading. If you get to 1 Timothy 6, then Paul gets stern. And he says, you know, there's a group of people that think that religion is just a way to make you rich. Now, one possibility you've probably seen or heard before is called prosperity theology. It's grounded in the letter of, um, of uh, John to the church where John says, in the greeting of the letter, Oh, beloved, above all things, I hope that you are well and prospering. Well, that's just like saying in our letters today, hello, how are you? But they turn it into a passage that says God wants you to be healthy and rich. And if you're not, there's something wrong with your faith. Now, that's still around today, and maybe that's what it was. But more likely, and you've all seen people like this who uh, may go, um, they need a new car, and so they go to the new car lot, and they lay their hands on a car and pray in the name of Jesus for God to give them that car. I mean, that's still around. But I don't think that's Paul's main issue. I think Paul's main issue is people that go around preaching and teaching the gospel in order to make a lot of money. You see, in Paul's world, there were traveling speakers. There were traveling orators. and Sometimes they had what we might call title sponsorships. You know how a group might sponsor a, a bowl game or, or they may sponsor a, a drive in the community. And so there were speakers that actually had rich people who were patrons and sponsored them. But for the majority, they would go from town to town on a circuit. They would give a speech about their philosophy, or in this case, their religion, and then they'd pass the plate to keep them in business. And Paul was concerned that some of these folks were teaching in order to get rich. And so Paul didn't do it like that. And actually, I found out the guy on TV with the pipe was kind of small potatoes, and one of the ways you can figure this is today, you know, Google net worth of TV evangelists. You will come up with some pretty astonishing figures. I saw ranges from 300 to 760 million. That's more than I've got. I mean, these, and maybe, maybe you saw three years ago, three years ago, um, where the uh, TV evangelist wanted to raise $54 million for a new jet plane. Do you remember this one? He had a perfectly good jet plane, but he said the problem was that jet plane, he'd have to stop and refuel to go to any place in the world that he wanted to go. And he said, I need to go when God calls me to wherever in the world, and I don't have time to stop and refuel my plane, so I need this new one for $54 million. Well, it's those kinds of things, I think, on, a diff on maybe a different scale, that's what Paul, I believe, is addressing in the letter to Timothy. Watch out for people who will try to use their faith 
or to use faith or the teaching of faith as a way just to try to get rich. But now having said that, next Sunday, as you know, is the Sunday we turn in in the basket when you come in or when you go, uh, estimate of giving for the coming year. So that always fills me with a little bit of trepidation because, spoiler alert, when the church releases a budget, I'll be on the payroll. So that makes me a little nervous. Makes me some nervous, but not nervous so much that I won't go there. Because here's what Paul knew. Paul knew that his people, whatever their situation, were likely at some point to face financial stress. And so he addressed it with Timothy. He addresses it with the Corinthians. Paul addresses it with the Philippians. I mean, Paul will go there. Jesus himself will go there. Do you, you probably know this, that the most popular subject for Jesus was the kingdom of God. But number two, survey says, money and possessions. Not sex, not good behavior, money and possessions. Jesus knew it could be a stressful point for the people. And I think Paul knew it as well. So Paul decides to address it. Now, first, let's look at what Paul doesn't do. Paul doesn't say money is bad. Paul doesn't say that. Paul says that uh, the love of money is a root, not the root, one translation, a root of evil. So Paul doesn't say money is bad, money pushed out of uh, perspective. So for example, if you had a, oh, I forgot it, a coin in your pocket, even as tiny as a dime, if I put it over my eyeball, that's all I can see. Paul doesn't want money to get that way for you or for me. It needs to be an appropriate and proper perspective. So he doesn't say it's bad. Second thing Paul doesn't say is get rid of it. Jesus said that once to a wealthy man, and it was obvious that his wealth was keeping him from making a deeper commitment to Christ. But to the rest of us, Jesus didn't say it, and neither did Paul. In fact, this is interesting to me. Jews actually developed a rule, and I don't know how much it was in effect in Jesus' day, but that they limited your giving to 20% to charity, 20% of your income. The reasoning was, A, if you give it all away, you could, uh, disaster could befall you, you could become destitute, and then what would happen? Uh, it's, in, it's also interesting to me that the early church, a lot of them, and, and I love it because they loved Jesus and just thought Jesus was coming back any moment, that they turned in everything they had. And then a famine hit, and Paul had to circle around behind them and raise money to send back to this early church in Jerusalem. So the Jews would say, limit it to 20%, first of all, so that you don't become destitute. Second of all, so that you still always have money to share when there is a need. When there's a new need, someone in the community, when there's a disaster in the world. I mean, how many of you respond, you know, whether it's the United Methodist uh, Committee on Relief or Red Cross when there's uh, another hurricane or an earthquake? And, and you can respond because you haven't given everything away. So Paul may surprise you by saying, by not saying money is bad, and by not saying give it all away. But Paul knows it's still a problem. And the problem is not money itself, but our perspective on it and our chasing of it to the extent our exclusion of prioritizing other things. That's where Paul says that uh, it has led people to wander away from the faith and also, my favorite line, has pierced them with much pain. When we chase more than what we have already, uh, life begins to get out of balance. And, and Paul could see that this could happen to his people. And we have seen it happen in our world as well. Um, in the Western world, there's a phrase you're probably familiar with called keeping up with the Joneses. This is kind of fun. Go back and Google that one, try to figure out where it came from. You'll get different answers. David McCullough, the historian, in a book on Americans living in Paris in the 19th century, says that was, there was a wealthy um, American family in Paris, the Joneses. They would throw these lavish parties, and in trying to keep up with them in their social circle, a lot of them couldn't afford to, and they'd get in trouble. Other people will say that it's really from a comic strip in 1915. Uh, where it comes out, it says, keep me up with the Joneses. And then another one actually came from a family who claimed to be related to the Joneses. And says, actually, her family lived in the Hamptons. And they hung out with the Vanderbilts and the Astors and other very wealthy people of the 19th century. 
and in trying, uh, and they could keep up, but other people could not keep up and began to fall financially by the wayside. So that's kind of been a Western thing sometimes is to kind of go for more than what we already have. But I think also there's an Eastern tradition that I think gets maybe closer at what Paul is saying, and that's this. Have you heard of the tradition of the white elephant? The white elephant, whether it's from a bank, uh, from Thailand or Burma or Cambodia, apparently goes something like this. Uh, the king wanted to do in one of his enemies, but the way that he would do him in is give them a very rare gift, a white elephant. And because it was a gift from the king, you had to keep it. And you had to make sure it was taken care of. The problem with a white elephant is they will eat you out of house and home. And so people would take every last resource they had to keep the elephant alive. And the king just sits on the throne and smiles. He knows they will exhaust themselves chasing after this, trying, uh, this effort to keep the elephant alive in their midst. And in some ways, I think that's what Paul's saying when we keep chasing after more than what we have, it is like that elephant that if we're not careful, it will suck every last resource out of us. And as Paul said, bring us much pain. So what does Paul recommend then? Two things, actually. I think these are the two things. Paul didn't say money's bad. He didn't say give it all away. Two recommendations, he said. Number one, he said, if you really want your faith to make you rich, practice contentment. Because the Jews had a saying, who is the rich person? The person that knows that what they have is enough. So with your faith and trust in God, you, you are rich because you realize what I have and is enough and where I am is enough. And you're not moving after the Joneses or somebody else. And so Paul would preach contentment, as other uh, faiths did as well. And uh, one of the things that uh, Paul knew, again, is that it was our discontent would lead us into trouble. Remember the, uh, John D. Rockefeller Sr., at one point, the richest uh, man in America? They asked him, Mr. Rockefeller, how much money is enough? You remember his response? A little bit more. More is a four-letter word. And so Paul preaches contentment so folks don't go there. And what's interesting to me is the Ten Commandments, the first one is, you have no other gods before me, thou shalt no other gods before me, and it's bookended by, and you shall not cover your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's donkey. And the thing about it is, is that they are bookends, and many rabbis said that the Tenth Commandment is a way to see if you have really kept the First Commandment. Because if you are looking at your neighbor and you want their house, their spouse, their vehicle in the driveway, their children, whatever it is they have, then you are beginning to worship something other than God who has given you what you have. Now, let me add the footnote real quick, the disclaimer. There, We are in America. The ma majority of us, most of the time, have more than enough to live on. There are people who do need more than what they have right now. So let me say that. But for most of us, the pursuit of more just adds to our stress. I don't know if you've seen um, the surveys. Um, I'd mentioned them before, but people uh, will tell you, counselors, that 80% of relationships that break up, break up over financial stress. At some level, there's finances at the bottom of it. Uh, and perhaps it's this lack of contentment. It also said this, that we are more stressed right now as Americans about money than we have been in decades Seven out of ten people say that they are experiencing some sort of financial stress at, uh, at this time. And that's higher by 1% than the Great Recession of 2008 and 9, where it was 69%. So I wonder, some is having enough to live on, but I wonder how much is this contentment issue. And so Paul's first advice is use your religion in a way that helps you be content with what you have. And then the second thing Paul says, if you're under financial stress and worried, this is almost counterintuitive. He said one of the ways to deal with stress is to give. One of the ways to deal with stress is to give. Have you uh, heard the saying, there are no luggage racks on hearses? Well, you can add this one to it. Rick Warren, the great Baptist pastor in California, said this, you, we know that you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. And what Paul is teaching them here is that when you give to causes, your time and energy, uh, talents, 
Uh, you are investing in something that will go on past you. And that is sort of, that is a powerful motivation to know that if you throw a pebble in the water of life right now, by your giving, you don't know where all the ripples will one day go. In fact, I believe that's part of what happens in eternity. It takes a while just to see all the things that we've done and watch them unfold in people's lives. People we never knew in places where we will never, ever go are touched by things that you and I have done. And so that's what Paul says is, look, it can't go with you. Riches are uncertain, but I tell you what, you can have a foundation, he says, for the future. What Jesus calls the foundation of the future is treasure in heaven. That's a phrase that was thrown around a lot uh, in Jesus' day. It was a way of saying uh, they knew you couldn't take it with you. As some people put it this way, money goes, but God uh, comes and goes, but God always stays. But there were eternal things that we could invest in that would make a difference, and they called that storing up treasure in heaven. And that is quite a return on investment when you give something and it goes on for forever. Well, I don't even know how to measure the percentage on that. And it wasn't a manipulation to try to get money in some pastor's pocket running through Ephesus and other towns. It was just a realization that the work of God and other good works, which are, would be the work of God, continue to go on and on and on. The great and late uh, missionary Jim Elliott put it this way, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot hold to gain what he cannot lose. She is no fool who gives up what she cannot hold to gain what she cannot lose. That was this other way of laying up a foundation in heaven. So Paul's other advice is that uh, you can give and participate in something bigger and longer than yourselves. And also, I have to tell you, for me, it's my way of declaring independence from always, the, always focusing on the little coin in front of my eye. When I give, it's a way of, it's a way of me saying to, to possessions, you don't own me. Or remember when your kids used to tell you, you're not the boss of me? I'm, it's my way of saying to possessions, you're not the boss of me. I'm independent. I can give. I can share. And so Paul knew that that was a way to help with stress. Well, Pastor Chanson brought some props last week, so I'm like, well, all right, I better do it. So under a little pressure, I came up with a couple things I wanted to show you this morning. First one, this is a sponge. I got it from my wife this morning, and she said, you're not taking that. It's nasty. And I said, precisely. Because one of the things I get in trouble for in the house is leaving the sponge in the sink with water and whatever else in it. And not having squeezed it out, it starts to smell. It starts to get a little crusty and probably is even growing some stuff I can't see. But I think that's what Paul's saying. When we only are about soaking up stuff for ourselves and we never wring it out for others, it gets nasty, it gets crusty, it gets, it gets really gross. And life can be that way. On the other hand, I think Paul would want to say, think of all that God has given you, time, talent, money, energy, relationships, of all that God has given you, think of yourself rather than as a sponge, but as a funnel. And a part of all this that God has given you flows through you to give something to others. And I simply think Paul is saying, look, this is, this is nasty, this is gross, this is a dead end, it will cause you pain. This will give life to others, but will also give life to you as well. Stories told of Timmy and his brother who were uh, left at home with their grandmother watching them. But they had gotten off and they were playing and Timmy got his hand in his mother's special vase and couldn't get it out. And so his brother uh, tried to help and pull it out, but it wouldn't come out. His brother cries for help, and, but not seeing any other solution, his brother goes and gets a hammer. Fortunately, at this moment, the grandmother walks in and said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. And she looks at Timmy, and she looks down in the vase, and Timmy is clutched, and he's nervous, and he's stressed. And she suggests to him, Timmy, why don't you relax? Let's try loosening your grip. Timmy begins to relax, loosens his grip. Grandma's help. 
the fist comes out. A little bit, remember like Winnie the Pooh got the honey jar stuck on her nose? Had to get help to get it off? I think Paul knows that financial stress can do that to us, can get us wadded up, can get us tight, can get us stuck. And Paul's just saying, one of the way out of this is, let's loosen our grip. Let's give life to God, to God's people, and to ourselves. and recognized all, uh, Veterans Day uh, on November the 11th. And the next piece that the, the bell choir is going to play is a piece called A Patriotic Salute. And each, in each uh, theme song of the, of the branch of the military is represented in that, this medley. Well, I would like to invite those who serve, when you hear the song that represents your branch of the military, I invite you to stand or raise a hand and then once that's completed, you may sit down. Uh, so we want, just want to recognize you for your service and thank you for your service.
I would now invite you to join in our closing hymn, hymn number 529, can be found in the blue Methodist hymnal, number 529, let us stand as we sing together, How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say? I'm so glad that you were with us this morning in person and online as we uh, continue to uh, think about stress together. Next week, we'll wrap up uh, the series with uh, one more uh, situation that many of us find stressful in life. And of course, I'm glad you were here as together we welcomed uh, John Bradford in to the family of God. Now, as you go from here, receive this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship with the Holy Spirit and all of God's people go with you and be with you today and always. Amen.